to open up our next session, we have Dr. David Howell. Dr. Howell is Assistant Professor and Assistant Director of Clinical Research in the Department of Orthopedics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. He has a Master's of Science and a Doctorate of Philosophy from the University of Oregon, so he's a duck. Excellent. Active current collaborations, both domestically and internationally. Dr. Powell currently has collaborations with Boston's Children's Hospital, the University of Delaware, Ching Mao University, and the University College in Dublin. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. David Howell. Thank you for the invitation to come talk today um, about some of the research that we're currently doing uh, related to preventing injuries after sport-related concussion. So rather than uh, preventing the primary concussion um, after an athlete has sustained a concussion and is cleared to return to play, um, how do we identify who's at risk for further injury in that next six months, a year, two years, um, and, and what can we do about it? So for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is David Howell. Um, I am a researcher at the University of Colorado School of Medicine in the Department of Orthopedics and the Sports Medicine Center at Children's Hospital. Uh, I have uh, research support from NIH and MindSource Brain Injury Network um, actively. Um, those are kind of my primary disclosures so that you know that. Um, really, I want to kind of talk about three different things today uh, in the 15 minutes or so that I have. Number one is just to get on the same page about the, the kind of existing literature and the theory about increased ri injury risk after a concussion. Number two, to outline the, the potential factors that contribute to increased injury risk after concussion. What are the things that, that people have investigated? And then at the end, a little bit of pilot data from some of our ongoing work and some theories about, you know, what can we do to actually intervene um, for individuals who have uh, sustained a concussion and clear to go back to sports um, to, to reduce their potential risk of, of further. Um, so we'll start with the first one. So, you know, uh, number one, you know, from a large scale perspective, what do we want to know? Well, if you sustain a concussion, um, as Clay Thompson did here a number of years ago, uh, you know, whether or not you continue playing or go back into the game or uh, uh, come out of the game for a prolonged period of time, um, and then you, you know, go through the, the normal kind of symptom-free uh, waiting period um, as a part of the return to play protocol. You do everything cautiously and, um, you know, every, by all signs and, and symptoms have gone away uh, of the concussion. You know, we, we kind of, again, this is under the auspices of best clinical practice. Uh, you know, when you say, okay, yes, you're clear to go back to, to sports, your brain has recovered from the concussion. Is there now an increased likelihood that you're going to land funny on your ACL, for example, or I guess on your foot, tearing your ACL? Um, and I know that this is kind of maybe a little bit of a dramatic example because these two happened a couple of years apart, but is there some relationship? And is that relationship potentially bi-directional where, um, you know, maybe it's just those that are injury prone more likely to get hurt? Um, we don't really know, but those are the things that I want to discuss today. Um, you know, taking a step back from routine clinical practice uh, or, or kind of taking it from that perspective, you know, we have these kind of commonly available tools, the SCAT-5, computerized neurocognitive tests, um, balance error scoring system that most clinicians use in their assessment of concussion. Uh, but we know that they're not super reliable um, tools to, to actually measure uh, recovery from concussion. Uh, at the same time, we know that we can uh, identify persistent physiological deficits after athletes have recovered on these kind of clinical tools. But what's the feasibility of doing a transcranial magnetic stimulation, diffuser tensor imaging, EEG, on a routine basis, right? They're really good for kind of experimental research grade purposes. But as far as clinical implementation, there's not a whole lot that we can glean from that at this point. Certainly a lot of work is being done. So how do we kind of find that best balance between so if we look into the literature uh, as far as what's been published thus far on increased injury risk, or I guess just generally injury risk after a concussion, we see two meta-analyses that have been published thus far, um, one showing 2.1 increased odds of sustaining a lower extremity musculoskeletal injury after a concussion in the year after a concussion relative to those who haven't, and one showing about a 2.5 increased odds. So both showing a, a significant effect across multiple and if we kind of break it down and look at the individual hazard ratios, injury, injury rate ratios, or odds ratios that have been published, we see a fairly consistent effect. Obviously, it ranges from, 
you know, about 1.3 um, up to about 3.4 increased odds at uh, times, uh, uh, increased odds of sustaining a, an injury after returning to sports from concussion. Um, one thing I do want to point out, though, is that a lot of the data that's been published, uh, you know, across multiple populations, you know, professional, military, collegiate, high school, recreational, um, a lot of the data comes from male athletes, um, from primarily male collegiate athletes. And so women really, I mean, among this table that I've um, uh, created here, only about 13% of the subjects included. So, you know, I think that's something that we need to consider moving forward or our kind of implications being that there's a, a 2.1 to 2.6 greater odds for subsequent injury after a concussion. This phenomenon exists across high school, collegiate, professional athletes, military personnel. But again, I think that that's important to know that we see it across populations, but important to understand that uh, females have, have not been studied to the degree of males. We know that there are some sex-based differences that exist as far as uh, concussion recovery. So let's look at the potential factors that might contribute to the increased injury concussion. So if we think about dual tasks and sports, so athletics is not just movement, there's a cognitive element to it. And I have to credit Rob Lionel uh, at the University of Georgia for finding this uh, uh, Twitter post from a, a soccer club um, somewhere in Europe, I believe. And uh, I think this is, you know, a player's decision to pass. You think about all the different cognitive processes that have to go into uh, you know, I, I think this was from, from the perspective of, you know, parents stop yelling at your kids is what Rob had said. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, even if there's a subtle deficit that's resulted from the concussion, by all, you know, signs and symptoms have cleared, all the tests you've passed, you're ready to go back in, there's a complex uh, cognitive pathway that, that has to uh, be executed for an individual to, to simply make a pass to their, their teammate on the, on the soccer pitch. And, and that involves distributing attention across different, you know, internal and external sources of stimuli, selecting the appropriate motor responses in, a, in response to those stimuli, and then rapidly kind of uh, implementing those responses and monitoring those responses, adjusting how you're going to move in a way that's going to protect you from injury. Now, what are the things that might contribute to this? Um, again, this is kind of a conceptual theory. Um, I have not published it. It's just not been vetted, so, so take it for what it is. But just a couple of things that have been proposed in this pathway of what causes MSK injury incidents after a concussion or what might modulate that risk. So one, um, as I just mentioned, is these lingering motor deficits. So we're not testing the ability of an athlete to uh, kind of do these complex motor tasks such as running, cutting, jumping um, in the real world with our commonly available concussion tests like, you know, something like the balance error scoring system. How often in sports are you standing on one foot with your eyes closed, um, you know, uh, for 20 seconds? Very rarely, I, I would hope. Um, and, and then at the same time, kind of these lingering attentional deficits. So if you can't distribute your attention properly across these different sources of stimuli, then perhaps you're at an increased risk for further injury. A couple other ideas that have been proposed uh, include deconditioning. So if you take an athlete who's used to exercising and, and undergoing the demands of their sport, Take them out of their sport um, for a couple of weeks and take and put them back in. Maybe there's an increased likelihood that they'll get an injury. Um, a couple other theories that have been um, uh, published recently is the concept of perception action coupling, um, or maybe just that injury prone athletes exist. And if you're going to get a concussion, you're more likely to get a musculoskeletal injury. If you're a risk taker, you're more likely to get any sort of injury. Um, and those two things may be. But let's kind of go through a little bit of, of what exists thus far um, in this literature. Um, one of the studies a couple of years ago from Berman and colleagues showed that, that, you know, while risk of injury, just in general, may be related to poor motor control, that might not have anything to do with the concussion itself. It may just have to do with, uh, you know, how the athlete controls himself on the field. And they've showed that athletes with a concussion have an increased likelihood of a lower extremity injury both before and after the injury. So there, there may be an effect of just the individual. Um, something like risk-taking behavior. So athletes who engage in quote-unquote risky behavior may be more likely to get any sort of injury. So if you lead with your head on the football field, maybe you're more likely to get uh, a concussion um, or, you know, a shoulder injury if you miss or something like that. Again, this is kind of conceptual or in the case of this rock climber, you know, I'm unlikely to die uh, or get injured falling from a height because I don't rock climb, right? So simply stated, this person is engaged 
in a uh, quote unquote risky behavior, they're more likely to have a, a fall from height than someone like me who's uh, marginally afraid of heights. Deconditioning is another um, kind of thing that has been uh, purported. And, you know, if an athlete rests following their concussion, they may uh, have a reduced kind of cardiovascular or neuromuscular control. Um, and that may affect their, their risk uh, profile when it comes to sports. Um, interesting, I mentioned Rob Lionel earlier. He, he's done a lot of work in this. Um, and, and his data actually suggests that this is not the case. This is collegiate athletes, but, but the increased likelihood of a uh, subsequent musculoskeletal injury after a concussion was not in that initial zero to six month post return to play time frame, but actually in that six to 12 month after uh, concussion and return to play time frame. So it, it doesn't appear that, that based on the existing data that we have, that that's a real strong driver of this likelihood. Two other theories that um, I mentioned have been kind of uh, put out there um, relate to perception action coupling. So there's some sort of um, uh, alteration in your ability to perceive information and couple that with the action. And if you haven't reestablished that following um, concussion or return to play, you might be at an increased likelihood of a subsequent. Or neuromechanical responsiveness. So kind of this complex uh, uh, path of various things that are affected by concussion and then modulate your future risk of injury, whether that be reaction time, balance, how your brain processes neural input, how you align yourself um, and, and how you respond to stimuli and, and different muscles. We, uh, we published a kind of a scoping review paper a few years ago um, looking at kind of this idea of neuromuscular control and kind of paired the existing literature at the time on musculoskeletal injuries after concussion with um, what we call neuromuscular control deficits, or I guess, um, you know, commonly assessed, we use dual task gait paradigms. And we see that, you know, neuromuscular control deficits after concussion may or, or are likely to be undetected by clinicians, right? What clinician has the time to go through a full gait analysis in a 3D motion capture lab? And then what do you do with that information? It's just not feasible. And if we know that these deficits can modulate injury risk independent of a concussion, if they're not recovered by the time the athlete has returned to play, then perhaps that's putting them at greater risk once they're actually. And some of our prelim data or, or published data, I guess, um, uh, that, that is, uh, you know, has its limitations for sure, um, you know, based on this at least was based on self-reported injuries in the year following a concussion. But we, we group people um, into uh, those who reported an injury in the year after returning to play following concussion versus those who didn't. And those who had a subsequent uh, acute time loss injury, injury showed kind of a worsening across time, panel B there on the right, um, on their dual task gait cost, which is uh, the ability to uh, kind of do two things at once, essentially. We're, we're measuring how fast a person walks under dual task conditions versus single task and calculating that change. So there may be some relationship. Um, this was just published by Jesse Oldham um, in MSSE just uh, uh, maybe last week, I think. Um, and I would encourage you to, to check it out. But uh, what she found um, was that following a return to play decision or at return to play um, after a concussion, the athletes who um, uh, went on to get a musculoskeletal injury in the year following the concussion had a slower gait speed. and in addition, kind of just this more conservative gait strategy. But this also kind of existed before their concussive injury as well. So this gets to kind of that poor motor control potential, um, as I mentioned earlier. So in the last kind of couple minutes, I just want to explore some ways to detect, intervene, uh, risk of injury, uh, risk of injury, concussion. And, and really a lot of the work we focused on is these top two, these motor and attentional deficits, as I mentioned, you know, kind of with this dual task we've been using. Now, a lot of work uh, led by Greg Meyer and a lot of his colleagues have, have established these injury prevention methods. Um, you know, knee injury rates uh, have, have been shown to reduce ankle sprains um, in youth soccer, basketball athletes, um, and a lot of female athlete studies. They're relatively simple to administer, and they really they incorporate plyometric strength training, um, technique training, things like that, to try to retrain that neuromuscular we're kind of combining all of these things together. We say, well, we know that these work independent of a concussion, 
Um, perhaps as a part of return to play, we can incorporate some of these exercises, lateral jump and hold, lateral jumps, hop and hold, things like that that, that go through. And we have some ongoing uh, work that unfortunately, like a lot of things, is disrupted due to our ongoing COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But at six months post return to play, um, we're having kind of this, we're having people randomized to a neuromuscular training program or nothing at all, kind of the standard of care return to play. And we see 9% at six months that underwent this training program have an injury, uh, one out of 11, um, whereas about 57% have had a subsequent injury who did not complete this um, and similar exposure between the two groups. So again, this is very preliminary data um, and, and I would ask you not to share it um, or kind of advertise it, but I wanted to, to put it out there so that we're starting to think about how do we actually intervene um, as a part of return to play and what can we do um, from a neuromuscular training standpoint. Um, there may be some continued beneficial effects on injury risk um, following uh, return to play clearance, further training the neuromuscular. So we see that concussion leads to a greater injury risk and there's measurable objective deficits um, after the concussion. So again, this is a pretty widespread problem. We don't have it down to a single factor. So I think this multifaceted approach is probably the best way that we, probably the best way that we can approach it right now. Um, and, and start considering, you know, whether it's motor or attentional training within routine um, return to play decisions. It may be appropriate. I don't think it's going to certainly cause any harm at this point. Um, and it might be interesting to see um, if, this, if this continues uh, and is something relevant that we can actually change within the return to play paradigms. So with that being said, thank you so much for um, the time um, and I look forward to the question and answer.